so thank you everybody for coming. This is like an amazing turnout for, you know, what it's month, like a nice, beautiful June, seven o'clock. So yeah, to hear me talk about this sort of crazy idea. So I have to like, I want to start by thanking you all. Um, I also want to like kind of start with a sort of preamble about, about this talk because I have a big favor to ask of you. Um, so this, I've been kind of stewing like really brooding over this idea for like a year and a half to two years. And it's, I've tried to remove every bit of extraneous, you know, uh, bit of it that I can. And I think it fits in about 60 minutes, which is absolutely like gratuitous for, for a talk. It's just like, I start to zone out after 30 minutes myself. So I have to like ask a big favor, but I'm not gonna go over 60 minutes. I absolutely 100% promise. So is that, we is that, intermission we could do that, yeah. If I start to see eyes glazing, like oh, maybe we'll, we'll do something like that. <laughs> Fair enough, yeah. Then, then, then we can kind of, yeah, go at a decent pace. But okay, um, so let's just get into the idea because there's kind of a lot to, to share. So the, the, the synopsis of this is I'm interested in initiating a project called Abraham. I'm gonna tell you all about Abraham and the idea is to create an autonomous artificial artist. So an autonomous artificial artist is a sovereign creative spirit, a decentralized AI that creates art, right? And I'm gonna make the case that it is fully conscious and alive and has its own creativity and all of those absolutely insane things. And I'm gonna try to make a case for this in the, in the scope of this talk. And actually just uh, to announce like the website is here so you can check it out later. And also this uh, tiny URL link is a link to the draft essay that I'm using to introduce, the, to introduce it. And it's kind of like a longer version of this talk that goes into way more detail, especially t technical detail. So um, we'll keep this kind of mostly non-technical just to get the sort of, well, the more spiritual side of it kind of in the, on the table. Um, just by way of introduction, so I know a lot of you, so I think a lot of you will obviously know me, uh, but for those who don't know, don't know me, I got interested in machine, I've been studying machine learning and art for a long time. I got interested in this question about 10, maybe even 12 years ago now, time flies, um, interested in the question of um, how to use machine learning for uh, finding music that I was interested in. As a big music collector, I was really interested in this question of music recommendation. And then I found that a lot of people in this space were applying the same tools to music production or making, making sort of tools for music producers or musicians. Um, that kind of got me interested in more of these artistic creative applications. I started doing new media arts. I discovered open frameworks and Arturo's work, of course. So um, that kind of, um, well, that propelled me into doing the kind of stuff that I do now. And then, all, and then kind of doubled back into machine learning when the sort of deep learning craze started. So this is the kind of stuff I've been doing over the last two years. I'm really interested in this idea of create uh, generative models and also creating sort of images and sounds and text using machine learning collected in all of our data. And this project is actually like a logical continuation of that, which I'll, well, which I'll show you in, in a minute. Um, so yeah, this is just some more of my work, making visuals, making loops, like kind of just having fun with these tools and trying to make things that, that are super colorful and appeal to me. Um, and then I'm also super interested in this technique of style transfer. Uh, this is all the kind of stuff that I've been doing, focusing on over the last few years. I also make art installations. So this is something called style transfer mirror or cubist mirror as it was originally called, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's just a mirror that turns you into some iconic painting. And I'm also uh, currently creating an installation at the new museum, the new <coughs> Futurium. So the museum that's opening in just a few months in September, right, um, right by Hopkonov. So this is the kind of stuff you'll be able to play with, a sneak peek. Um, this is basically like you get to you know, finger paint and turn it into a sort of landscape painting, something, something like that and Cubist Mirror will be there and everything. So uh, if you're here in September, definitely go check that out. Um, opening September 5th, I'm gonna try to make it, even though I have to teach, it's kind of, well, yeah, that's all stuff to sort out. Um, I like to, I like to kind of share what I do and make a lot of fun. So I'm, I'm really interested in how these tools are gonna be used in the future in more serious ways. And I often think that like creativity and humor are vehicles for exploring these, you know, 
more serious concepts. I often use myself as the subject of the of these sort of humorous <laughs> exploits. So you know, this is well, yeah. The, this is this is the actual painting before I was removed from it, um, and so is this one right here. Uh, it's, uh, um, I also run workshops. So I've been teaching machine learning for artists and sort of creative AI for the last couple of years. It's been almost like a full-time practice for me. Maybe so, um, I think a number of you have taken workshops with me, so it's good to see you all back. Um, actually, the biggest bulk of my classes have been in this very room here at School of Ma in Akud. So it's, thank you very much to my hosts. Always, always yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, and I also record a lot of my lectures and place them online. So, um, so yeah, that's all stuff that is available for you. If you're interested in this sort of creative AI idea, um, please do check it out. And you can find this all in this uh, website, mlfreya.github.io. You might recognize some of the people in this picture. <laughs> this is just some of the cool tools that you might be able to, to kind of apply to your, to your work. You know, lots of sort of pre-built tools for doing machine learning inside of a browser or inside your computer and uh, applying it creatively. Um, okay, so let's get into this idea of an autonomous artificial artist. Now, I first want to, the first thing I want to say about it is that the idea is not mine. Um, it's not new exactly. It's an idea that has been kind of manifest in various flavors over many, many decades. And I would place it in the set, at the confluence of these four major fields. So computer art, um, artificial intelligence, obviously. Um, crypto economics. So this is probably sure to raise some eyebrows here. This is a more obscure term than some of the others. But this idea of crypto economics is starting to gain traction mostly on the internet. And it kind of describes the, uh, let's say, the mashup of economics and game theory along with decentralization technology. So blockchain, you know, cryptocurrencies and all that. Um, the kind of the study of social systems under the constraints of decentralization. So this is something that you can look up. I have links to it in the essay. Um, and, and, uh, and then the fourth one is philosophy of mind. And this is one that's kind of a black hole for me because I'm not trained as a philosopher. But I keep on brushing up into these, you know, into these idea of what, well, first of all, like on every single panel I've ever done, it's, the question is either like, can a machine be creative or what is creativity? So I decided, like, instead of answering that question many, many times, I just do a whole art project about it. Um, and this is going to be a case to, uh, we're trying to make a case that a machine can be creative, and we'll kind of define those things formally. Um, all of these things intersect in various ways. So, you know, when you start to think about philosophy of mind and, and artificial intelligence, you get into this idea of super intelligence, right? What is this idea of super intelligence? Um, crypto economics and artificial intelligence, merge, you get decentralized AI. And I've taught a couple of workshops about that. So what happens when AI is kind of enmeshed in decentralized substrate, let's call it. Um, then there's this really huge emerging scene between computer art and crypto economics where people are trying to put art on the blockchain. So this sort of idea of crypto collectibles. So crypto kitties is probably the most popular example of that, very popular here in Berlin. Um, and then uh, all any three of these fields intersect, you start to get more and more sort of niche ideas, um, which are more and more out there. And I'm going to actually, in the course of this talk, I'm going to brush up against all of them. So art DAOs, AI DAOs, um, and then the autonomous artificial artist idea is, try, is, is a, an attempt to kind of find um, a plausible idea in the center of all of these things. So I'm going to kind of build up to it. Um, Okay, so like, what is, what is my motivation? What is, what is the objective here? So it's to create an artificial artist, which is, which is a concept that has had a lot of momentum for many, many decades. A lot of artists have been constantly talking about you know, making these autonomous art systems. Um, but one of the problems that they all have, in my view, is that they lack autonomy. They, they are sort of like a program that you put on your computer and you turn it on and you tell it exactly what to do. And maybe there's some bit of randomness in there, but otherwise it's still, it's still kind of like sort of your art, let's say. And um, I want to create an, uh, uh, something which, well, an artificial artist, which in this sense creates unique and original artworks, but is also autonomous. So it sort of demonstrates its own agency or independence, right? So it's, it's, it's as independent from all of us as we are from each other. And uh, so these are kind of abstract ideas, and they're necessarily abstract. You know, like even if, 
forgetting the whole autonomous artist idea, if we had a discussion about them, it's probably the case that there would be 50 different definitions or ideas about this. So um, these things are hard to really pin down. We can get impressions of them, and I'm going to kind of give you my take on it, I guess. Um, and I also look to nature for inspiration. So how to create intelligent autonomous systems? Well, we have to look towards the only intelligent and autonomous systems that we've ever seen, and those are in nature. And so we're going to kind of use those as analogies um, to, to frame, this, frame this idea. Okay, so like I'll give you, I'll start to talk about what, I'm, what I mean by autonomy. And uh, the definition, if, if you could call it that, that I'll take of autonomy is that it's something that is observed as like an emergent phenomenon, right? Mm -hmm. So this idea of emergence, which is really, really a key idea in generative art, is that things can, can emerge as sort of second order effects from many, many smaller processes, right? So what are these? These are dunes, right? Um, but what are dunes? Do you, you all see the dunes, right? But of course, everyone knows that there's nothing there but a whole bunch of grains of sand. And so your brain kind of picks them out and says, these are, this is a dune, and this is a dune, and this is a dune. So we understand this idea that a lot of things, almost all things that we have words for, are really, at the end of the day, emergent phenomena. There's something that emerges from smaller bits and pieces. And uh, this is going to be kind of the way that we seek to, we seek to demonstrate autonomy. Um, and then collective intelligence, which is, which is the idea that systems of many small, intelligent, interacting bits have this greater intelligence that transcends the smaller bits, right? So, and we already have words for this in our culture, right? So like hive mind, this is a term that goes back decades and it refers to the, the observation that a colony of bees or any hive seems to have uh, an intelligence that's kind of separate from all of the individuals within it, all of the individual bees and so on. So this is this notion of a hive mind that I want to explore. Um, bees, termites, this is some termites in the uh, Australian outback, uh, flocks of birds, uh, there's all sorts of examples of this. And we're going to try to, we're going to try to create intelligence and autonomy through this process of, of collecting intelligence, sort of. So yeah, you'll hear a lot about collective intelligence today, so I don't want to ruin the word. Um, okay, so the basic idea is we're going to make an art program a generative art program, so it generates art, and its, go and its behavior, its output is going to emerge from the collective intelligence of all of the people or entities, let's just say, let's keep it open, um, <laughs> who make it. And, um, and so, so yeah, this is, this is we're going to be the super organism. We're going to try to make this generative art piece, and none of us will be able to really you know, like your, your, your one action will not drive the artist. It will be the collective action of all of us. And this, of course, requires decentralization because if one person or maybe a group of people were the driving force behind it, it would be like it would be a puppet for that person. And so this necessitates decentralization. It actually gives a purpose to decentralization, I think. Um, okay, so the building blocks of this idea are in the following... Are, are, I think in the following, so I'm basically going to introduce a few building blocks, like technological building blocks, that are going to enable this idea. Um, so, and some of you may be familiar with some of them. Um, maybe a number of you are familiar with this idea of a decentralized autonomous organization, a DAO. So how many people here, raise your hand if you've heard of DAOs or you know, DAOs. So a good number of you, like looks like half, right? So this is a, a term that's also, just like AI, it's not very well defined. You know, this is a term that you'll get a lot of different definitions for it. Some people just say it's a decentralized company, basically. Uh, for me, I want to pursue this uh, autonomy as an emergent, you know, observation of the system. This is the way that I would conceive of them, and we'll kind of get into those. Uh, we'll talk a little bit. Of, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about um, decentralized private machine learning, right? And this is so I do a lot of machine learning, and machine learning is. Um, obviously very, very consequential, influential, and there are a lot of efforts underway, quite separate to all of this, that seek to create decentralized mechanisms for, for doing machine learning. And we'll talk about what, what that means exactly, like what makes it decentralized, and why would we do that? 
Um, that's something that we'll get into a bit later. And then uh, this curation markets and social coordination, these are all of these crypto economic ideas of how to structure, govern um, decentralized organizations. And for us, if it's going to be decentralized, it means that we're going to need mechanisms to govern ourselves, like democratic mechanisms that allow people to coordinate, many people to coordinate over, over shared goals. In this case, the shared goal of building uh, an artist. And then generative models, which is making cats, basically. Generative models making cats. Um, okay, so the first thing I'll talk about is generative models. So what are generative models and why are they interesting? Um, this has been probably my, my, my most um, active area of inquiry, let's say, as an artist for the last couple of years. I'm really interested in generative models. They are any kind of model, almost entirely neural networks now, which are able to synthesize uh, data, which looks like it came from the original data set, it basically looks like real life, but is totally hallucinated, totally imagined. Right? So these are cat memes on the left, um, TV screens on the center, and cars on the right. None of these have, have existed. And these are very interesting to scientists because, um, and I think for, because uh, this Richard Feynman quote I think captures it very nicely. What I cannot create, I do not understand. So when we are able to create things, we are able to or reconstruct them, let's say, we understand them better. And so generative models, and they, they have a lot of important applications as well, um, but for the scientifically curious, that's kind of the justification for studying them. Um, now, generative models are almost entirely done with neural networks, right? And neural networks is something that I have spent the majority of my time using. They're kind of dominant within machine learning right now. Neural networks are these, these sort of data structures, these graphs, which contain neurons, units that contain value, and they project those values through a bunch of mathematical operations, usually basically additions and multiplications, almost, and just a few others, but basically those. Um, through this sort of computational graph until it un emerges at the output with some having fulfilled some task that we wanted to do. So classification in this sense, so this is a dog obviously. Um, neural networks have many, many uses. They're extremely generic containers for, for, doing, machine, well, for doing machine learning. Um, they can do things like locate uh, or identify objects. They can do things like convert images into other kinds of images. They can detect people's poses. They can uh, turn black and white photos into colored photos. They, they just have all sorts of uses. And they, they've been what I've been mostly teaching in my workshops for the last couple of years. Now, a very specific kind of a generative model, is, uh, sorry, a very specific kind of a neural network is a generative model. So most generative models, although they don't have to be, can be implemented with neural networks. The idea is that this neural network takes in some random sequence of numbers. Um, it might as well be random for, for our purposes. It's often called like a latent vector or a latent input or something like that. And it goes through this computational graph getting multiplied and added to and transformed at each layer. And then at the outset, you have a bunch of pixels if it's a, an image. And if it's audio, you might, get, you might have samples, right? So samples of audio. If it's, uh, it, or if it's text, they could be words. It could be outputting words. Um, in this case, it's outputting you know, images of cats. And the idea is that as you modulate these, these numbers, you get different cats, basically, or whatever it was happened to be trained to do. So this is kind of the, the top level way of looking at this. It's a big oversimplification, but, it's, but for our purposes, it's, it's pretty much fun. Um, so this is a generative model. Um, generative models are essentially trained with data sets of the thing that you're trying to model, right? So faces, and if this is, a, this is celebrity faces, so this generative model can learn how to synthesize celebrity faces. If you give it cats, it'll learn cats. If you give it disco balls, it'll learn disco balls. Um, and we've seen, we've seen all sorts of variants of this. I have a slide that actually has some examples. Um, there's kind of two categories of these that are very, very prevalent in machine learning. They're the most dominant ones. So that the one that people hear the most about are generative adversarial networks, GANs, right? They're so, they've become almost synonymous with generative models. So even when, even when they're not GANs, you'll hear GANs, 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 GANs. 
Um, and GANs are this really neat idea that was that kind of um, they, um, a researcher named Ian Goodfellow came up with in 2014, about five years ago, and they've exploded. There's been sort of a Cambrian explosion in GANs. There's just been because they're extremely realistic. They produce a lot of very sharp images. They have some drawbacks, but but they they work pretty well. Um, the other one that I'm kind of I'm putting my money into autoencoders. I think they're starting to catch up. Um, they have some important properties, and you know this is the kind of stuff that I mostly cover in my workshops. But we'll leave aside for now. Um, and then there's all there's other kinds, but these are the ones that we're familiar with. And all of them, you can see that in both of these, like the decoder, it, and uh, in the in the um, autoencoder and the generator in the GAN fit this description, right? There's like a sequence of random numbers, and then it outputs an image, right? So here you have the same thing, some sequence of random numbers. I've lost my mouse here, but, um, but sequence of random numbers, output a random image. Um, so this is kind of the, the idea of, of um, generative models. This is a tweet from Ian Goodfellow that shows the progress that we've seen in GANs. So this is four and a half years ago. All we could do was make these sort of blurry, black and white, very generic looking faces, right? And then they keep on becoming better and better and better and sharper until we're making super high resolution, almost indistinguishable from, from real faces, right? These are completely fictitious people. Um, and uh, actually this tweet doesn't fully capture just how much progress we've made because it's not drawn to scale. So if you actually want to see it to scale, to pixel scale, it's actually like this. So this is what we had in 2014, and that's what we have in 2018. And so extrapolating this forward, we're going to have probably like life size, I'm sure, you know, within, within another year and a half. Um, artists love GANs. Um, GANs, 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 GANs. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I mean, that's, this is kind of where we're at. Like you've probably seen a lot of these works. These are all made by, by people I know. In fact, these are all like artists. Some of them have been here. Um, lots of just like a... A, a Cambrian explosion in artworks with GANs. Why do artists love GANs? Um, does anyone want to take a stab at that? Like, is there, does anyone have an idea? Because they're easy to get cool stuff out of. That's a good point, yeah. <laughs> they are easy to get cool stuff out. There's a lot of novelty in them, right? There's kind of like, you know, we didn't really know that we could do this so well until fairly recently. And for, for me, I've been interested in them for a long time, but I've been kind of struggling to to understand why they're interesting to me. I and mean, this, this project is kind of getting at the heart of that um, and, and in, the, in the way that you'll see. So the thing that, we, that I had on while, while you were all introducing yourself was actually a, uh, a type of GAN called a style GAN. This is a GAN that was made by uh, DeepMind, or was it NVIDIA? I always forget, confuse them. So DeepMind, OpenAI, OpenAI, Google Brain, NVIDIA, they sort of like mesh together in my head. Um, gigantic corporations that have a lot of like machine learning resources and scientists, they made something called a style GAN, which is a really really neat type of, um, of generative adversarial network. And I trained it on roughly 100,000 paintings scraped from WikiArt. So this is the the latent space of paintings that you can find the WikiArt. So you know a lot of these should look kind of familiar. You know like weird portraits and landscapes. You can see there's a ton of diversity in them. Um, you know. And then this is one model, right? This is one model that captures all of these different painting styles. So they're really impressive. They have a lot of like really expressive potential. Um, and they have their own very like unique artifacts that, um, that people are starting to kind of attune themselves to. Um, just some more examples of that, abstract works, document archive looking things, portraits, you know, surreal sort of like Salvador Dali looking thing on the left. Um, weird globe, you know, weird portrait, this kind of stuff. Um, so I asked this question, like, why are, why is, why are GANs and generative models interesting to me? And my reasoning goes something like this. Um, the, the idea is that there's, we have this metaphor that GANs are imagining, right? Or generative models imagine new kinds of images, right? And they imagine images learned from our data. And so I think that they're kind of a window into this human faculty of imagination. And um, if you go back, like there's been a lot of very, very, you know, some, somewhere between science and art, ideas about 
collective unconscious, collective imagination. There's a lot of literature and research about this idea that maybe we have a sort of shared, a shared imagination. That we have these archetypes. You know, if you think about like Carl Jung's idea, the collective unconscious, we have shared archetypes of things. And there is a um, a lot of research that has indicated that collective wisdom, collective knowledge, when it can be obtained, is more accurate than that of individuals. So there's this famous experiment, I think, that goes back to, I don't remember, maybe the 80s or something like that, where they, add, where they put like a whole bunch of jelly beans in a jar. I mean, people are familiar with this experiment. It's pretty famous. The idea is you have all these beans in the jar, and then they ask random people to guess how many beans are in the jar. And if you, so if you do this, you get all sorts of wild answers, like 200, 2,000, 20,000. It's like really hard, actually, to, to kind of think volumetrically. So people's guesses are all over the place. But what turns out that if you average all of their guesses, it reliably comes out to be almost exactly correct, or at least more accurate than, than that of all of, the, all of the actual individuals, right? Um, or most of them, anyway. And so this idea that as you add more and more numbers, you approach the true average of things, right? And there's actually a statistical law about this, and it's the law of large numbers. So uh, there's at least one mathematician here, right? So <laughs> there's a couple people who might have studied this idea. The law of large numbers says that as you add more and more samples, you approach the true mean, the true average of something. So if you flip a coin 10 times, there's a good chance that you'll get 60% heads and 40% tails. But if you flip it 100 times, it's going to be, let's say, 51 or 52 percent, 48 percent. If you flip it a million times, you're going to have 50-50 almost, almost exactly. So, at, so the idea of this collective imagination is if we can get all of the world's data, basically everybody's pictures, all of them, like 100 percent of them, we will approach something that is kind of converging on our collective imagination. And so this is the motivation for this project. Um, so I will stop at nothing. Abraham must have all of the world's <laughs> pixels. So this is, this is all of them. Yeah. Um, okay. So I'm going to swerve entirely and introduce something completely different. Uh, decentralization. Right? And this is kind of the... the um, I'm, we're, these two topics are going to merge in just a few moments. Right? So uh, like many of you, I first encountered decentralization through things like Napster and um, you know, BitTorrent. And you know, decentraliz decentralization is actually kind of the, one of the early goals of the, the early internet, right? before it became sort of dominated by, by, by companies. Um, but then when Bitcoin came around, it kind of changed things a little bit, because suddenly you had decentralization with a way to exchange value. Now, when I first encountered Bitcoin, I was like, okay, kind of neat, but I'm not super interested in finance. I'm not super interested in, in sort of financial instruments, so I wasn't super interested. Um, what started happening, though, was that a couple of years later, um, oh, and just remember, like 2008, of course, that would have been the, the justification, because what happened in 2008? Well, it was like the, the world's banks basically defrauded the whole planet of one quarter of its wealth, approximately. So it's easy to understand why, why Bitcoin would have had the justification that it did. Um, but a few years later, things started to change a little bit. Um, things like Ethereum came around, and we started conceptualizing the idea of other things without government. So, so this is kind of the layers of understanding decentralization. You know? and, and it was still mostly financial instruments. You know, people thought, okay, we have money, but maybe we can have other stuff as well. Like maybe we can have um, health insurance co-ops, let's say. Or maybe you can have a decentralized escrow. It was still mostly financial in nature, but, uh, but beginning to approach complexity that would allow us to do sort of more interesting things. And for me, it kind of be started to be click, let's say, became, become interested, interesting around 2016, 2017, when um, people began to talk about DAOs. And actually, DAOs go back to maybe 2014, but they really sort of hit peak, peak uh, conversation in 2016. And the realization that I had, and this is kind of my take on it, is that the early justification for decentralization was kind of like anti-authority. It was like, we can have money and all these financial instruments and all this other stuff without government authorities or centralized intermediaries, you know, basically get the government away from this, right? 
Um, but the funny thing is that the more interesting way of thinking of it, in my opinion, is completely the opposite. What we have now is a way of creating new authority in cases that we never would have had the resources to do so otherwise. Because if you want to create some sort of, a, let's say, an economy, small economy, let's say School of Ma like had its own little economy, then how do you enforce that? Well, you need police officers, you need you know, expensive ways of enforcing justice and peace. And um, for most applications, it just, you just can't, it's not worth the cost that, authority, that, the, you, that it would require to have that kind of authority. Um, but now we have a way of creating authority for very cheap. The cheapness of a mathematical calculation on a computer, right, cryptography. So with cryptography, suddenly we could inject authority into very, very, very small, kind of tiny microeconomies. And that's sort of what we're seeing now. Um, and in, you know, I wish I could talk more about this angle, but, but this is sort of, and we will a little bit, but this is kind of for me the clicking moment and where, where I started realizing like we now have ways of organizing that we otherwise didn't have before, like truly novel ways. And, and there's also a lot of comparisons to decentralization in its current state to the early internet. So think about the 90s, right? So in the 90s, like the first generation of websites, pre-2000, pre-Google, pre-Facebook, all that, they were things like pets.com. Uh, they were like block, Blockbuster Video had a website, right? They were basically businesses trying to cash in on the, you know, the, the, the hype around the internet, but they were otherwise basically legacy business models, right? And things didn't become interesting until a good 10 years, 15 years later, when people began to form ideas that took advantage of the technology natively, right? So pets.com, which was just a brick and mortar store with a website, you know, could not have foretold us about social media. No one was thinking about social media in 1995. I mean, maybe like a few people. Um, but, uh, but at the time, it seemed like a very far off concept. And so now we're kind, of, and, and we're kind of getting to the point where as the technology allows for it, as it scales, then we might start to see completely new ideas that, that are very much not like the things that we've been able to do before. And so one of them I think is Abraham. And so this is kind of like, and it may not be 2020, but, but you know, sometime in the modern future. <laughs> so I want to check my timing. How am I going? It's been like, when did we start? 7.45? Something like that. Um, okay, well, let's, let's do it this way. Um, we could take a break. Right? I'm roughly halfway, I'd say. Uh, is it a good time for a break, or should I just keep going? Yeah. Okay, Raise your hand if I should keep going. Like, okay, keep going. All right, that's good. Right. So I'll, I'll, I'll kind of make it like relatively quick so that you guys can have the food because, before, because we, you need to do that. So. Um, okay, fine. So let's just keep going. Uh, so let's, let's scale up decentralization. Right? So um, in the beginning, there was Bitcoin. So w what is Bitcoin? Bitcoin is, uh, of course, like, I mean, it's, it's, the sim it's, it's, of course, very valuable in the sense money, right? But, but it's really also, one way of thinking about it is, is it's the simplest possible thing you can do on the blockchain. Uh, the, the program that Bitcoin is, is really simple. There's just a ledger. There's just a, basically like a, an Excel spreadsheet. You can think of it as a gigantic Excel spreadsheet with two columns. People's accounts and how much money they have. And there's one function, minus X, you know, bitcoins to account A plus X bitcoins to account B. And so this requires very little, you know, programming steps, very, very little computation. Uh, but however, it's decentralized, so it's very inefficient way of doing it. But, but still, it's a small program. So it's the easiest thing that you can possibly do in the blockchain. Um, then you started to see things like people began to scale up this idea, and Ethereum came along and said, okay, maybe it, we could actually create programs that are more complex than, than you know, just transferring money from one account to another. Maybe we can have uh, programming statements like if... If, like, let's say you could have a statement like A gives money to B if condition C is met, right? Or maybe you can uh, create for loops or something or time statements. And, you know, basically this idea of a programming language on the blockchain emerged. And then people began to think, okay, maybe, maybe we don't just have cryptocurrency, but maybe we have ways of representing virtual assets 
or even real world assets. You know, so now we have this idea of um, like let's say a decentralized car to go. Maybe you, we have a whole bunch of of uh, collectively owned cars that uh, that unlock when you demonstrate that you have some token which is tied to the blockchain, and that you can transfer that token to another person so that they can have the car. And otherwise, nobody actually owns the car. Um, so, for those who are interested in these ideas, and actually interested in even extending those ideas into nature, which is really cool, there's actually a really awesome sort of meetup here called Nature 2.0, which, which I think there's an occasional meetup here, which is really worthwhile to check out. Um, but anyway, yeah, DAOs basically doing these somewhat more complicated transactions. Um, now, finally, we get to decentralized machine learning. And I put this in the question mark, and I write, wrote some fine print here that this is really hard. So it turns out this is really hard, <laughs> and it's not really, really practical yet. But there's a good chance it will become practical, and I'll describe why it's so hard. When you train a neural network, let's say a neural network that is designed to classify dogs, um, it requires not just one mathematical operation, you know, minus, or okay, in the Bitcoin transaction, it's two. It's like minus X from account A plus X from account B. Um, you need millions of operations, right? Because a neural network, to just do a forward pass through a neural network, is really, really consuming in terms of computation. That's why we have huge GPUs to do them. Um, even a small neural network would, would take a really, really long time. So like, I don't know if anyone has tried to do like back of the envelope calculation, but if you were to try to like train a neural network to do even the simplest image recognition task on Ethereum, it would take like a century to train it. And that's not an exaggeration. It's like something, something along that order of magnitude. So obviously we're going to need to make things work a little bit differently. So people are trying to figure out ways of having decentralized machine learning, which, is, which can perform, and certainly not perform as well as centralized machine learning, but, per, but well enough that it actually works. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about how some of these methods actually work. So first of all, before getting into decentralized machine learning, let's talk about centralized machine learning, the kind of machine learning that everyone is familiar with, because you encounter it every time you open up a computer, basically. Um, how does centralized machine learning work? So when you interact with a website, you are sending your data, your browsing data, and not, not only your browsing data on that website, but probably browsing data from other websites as well, because that's how the internet works, um, it, to, to AI Incorporated, let's call them. You know, so that's Google, Apple, Facebook, um, Amazon, and pretty much nobody else. Um, so you send them your data. They train a neural network to do some service for you better. And then they provide you that service for free. So you get a service for free. You get to use Facebook for free. You get to use, you get to, I mean, Amazon, you have to pay for goods, but you get to use the website for free. Basically, all of these websites are mostly free. Um, so, so that's how centralized machine learning works. So the problem, as we've seen, is that this doesn't work. So first, does anyone recognize this, this website? You should recognize it because it's every website. It is every website is like this now. Like, what is going on? Like, there's 40 million pop-ups that goes like, we value your privacy. You know what that means. You know, it's like, the internet is broken, basically. It's a wonderful, wonderful movie made by this guy, Daryl Ginn. Uh, it's just terrible, right? Yeah. So, okay, so like, what's wrong with this? Why, why is the internet becoming so bad? <laughs> why is the internet becoming so shabby? So there's a bunch of things wrong with centralized machine learning. Or let's, let's say vulnerabilities. One is that aggregating all of the data into one place is a massive target for hackers. Like every three months, we hear about some huge breach of you know, the, all of this data being stolen, sometimes millions of accounts, even billions of accounts. Yahoo announced like last year that they had a breach that breached three billion accounts. That's like half of the whole human population. <laughs> and to be fair, like two and a half billion of them are probably bots. But like, because it's Yahoo, but, <laughs> but, but still, like, that's crazy. That's a crazy breach. Um, second problem is conflicts of interest over privacy, right? So you have all this data, and a lot of it is very personal, and it's being used to basically try to sell you stuff that you don't need. 
And so and, and there, there's all of these conflicts of interest over that because you, know, you want your data to be a little bit more private and the company wants it to be a little bit less private. Um, and, and that also compromises security, by the way, right? because the same tools that make your data private are also the ones that make it secure. So when they're, they're constantly trying to undermine our privacy and therefore our security in order to, you know, for their bottom line, basically. Now, the third one, this is kind of more subtle, is conflicts of interest over the objectives of the website. So everyone has the experience of browsing your social media site and becoming really, really angry and then reading it even more and then becoming even angrier. And, you know, the idea is that all of this is, is not a coincidence. The websites are extremely good at drawing in your attention and keeping you on the website no matter what emotions it creates out of you. And, um, and this is because they don't necessarily have exactly the same interests as you. Like in the normal business customer relationship, there's a negotiation between the business and the customer where the customer doesn't want to use the service if it doesn't meet the, satisfy their objectives, right? But remember you're using this, these websites for free, so you're not a customer, <laughs> you're a product. You're not actually consuming the, you're, you're not consuming the services you are to be consumed. Um, and so now of course, like indirectly, they have to satisfy some of your objectives because they want you to keep coming back, but your objectives are maybe tangentially aligned, you know, only like sort of 60%. And so you get a lot of conflicts over that. And that's why websites, you know, they, it's not trying to maximize Spe uh, objectives that we have about about ourselves they're trying to just simply maximize our time spent on the website um, now uh, here's a fourth one that's related to the second one so uh, privacy a lot of really and this is this is kind of this is kind of a neat one but all right well a lot of interesting applications of machine learning potentially valuable ones uh, require data that's just too sensitive that you wouldn't ever want to share it so think about things that would be very beneficial for your health especially your mental health so th things like things uh, of this sort, it turns out that machine learning algorithms know a lot about us. They can actually infer a lot of really, really unbelievably crazy information about us. Things that not only your friends don't know about you, but you may not even know about yourself. And all of these applications, which could be valuable, are prevented because, of course, you're not going to share them. Right? So the, one of the value propositions of private machine learning, machine learning that guarantees your privacy, is that maybe you can actually create services that work on top of sensitive data and guarantee that that sensitive data is never seen by other people. Um, so that's kind of like an interesting use case that we don't really have uh, tools for right now. Uh, another one is this lost natural income. So, um, and this, has been, this point has been made for, for a good solid 20 years. Um, you create data and the company sort of harvests and monetizes your data. And the data is valuable, obviously, that's why the company takes it. Um, it's, and so what is this exchange where you give data, which is in, intrinsically valuable, but you, don't get, but you don't get to keep any of the value for it, right? You're, you're giving away uh, something that could, in a sense, be considered a form of labor, right? Because you're, you're laboring, no, people don't take this seriously, but really you're laboring, browsing the internet, creating value for companies, and you don't get to keep any of it. Um, so there's this last natural income, which, which many people have written about. Um, and then the last one is that power gets concentrated into this sort of data oligopoly. The, uh, what is it, GAFA, so Google, Amazon, Facebook, Apple, um, that, that are very, very, they have so much leverage, right? Because other companies, because of network effects, they, they can't really compete with them because you're starting at the bottom, you have no data, and so how are you going to get data? Well, you have to attract customers, but you don't have any data, so you're not going to be able to attract them because you can't do anything for them. And so there's this kind of like, the problem of network effects is very, very paramount here. And so this is, the, and so this is a huge problem as well, and it stifles, it stifles innovation, and, um, and we're kind of seeing the results of that. Like we're, the, the web is becoming more and more sedentary. Right? There was a nice tweet the other day where it was something like, in 1999, there were millions of websites that all hyperlinked to each other. And in, two, in 2019, there are four websites filled with screenshots of the other three. <laughs> so this is a, I, I can't remember who made the tweet, super viral, very, very funny. Okay, um, so how can, what might we be able to fix this? 
Now, by the way, and obviously I haven't talked about the autonomous artificial artist thing for a while. We'll get back to that because this is a component of that. But it's actually like more interesting in its own, for its own sake uh, because it intersects with all these other things that we find valuable. So the first thing is this idea of federated learning. And federated learning is already being done at scale by Google and Apple and, and, and all of the others. Um, and the, and, um, but it's not quite enough. And I'll describe what federated learning is. Instead, in federated learning, instead of the data being collected by a company, uh, instead, the company says, okay, we're not going to collect the data. We're going to give you the neural network that we have, our model. We're just going to ship it to your device so that you can use it. And then you ship back to us feedback, sort of these what are called learning updates or in the neural network sense, gradients. They're basically things that fix the neural network, make it perform a little bit better. So we, you, we, you send a copy of the network as a, the company and then you get back feedback about it. You use that to make the model smarter and then, and then this never requires a data exchange. So uh, this is federated learning. It's done already on your, on your, on your iPhones and your Androids for things like spell check and, and other, other applications like that. Um, now, federated learning has some, some problems because it sounds like it solves our problem. It, so, it sounds like it solves our data privacy problem, uh, but it doesn't quite solve it for, for reasons that are super technical. So there's a whole field um, called differential privacy, which deals with more or less how you reconstruct data from uh, database queries that don't require you to look at the original uh, or original data. So it turns out that you can infer data if you really want to, or even copy it inside of a neural network um, in, uh, in when you just have federated learning. Uh, the model is sort of not secure. So now, I mean, this is also a problem for AI Incorporated. It's sending the model to all these people, any of them can just copy it and use it for their own purposes and maybe undermine their business model. Now, this is you know circumvented in all sorts of ways. I mean, I think they, you know, make it binary and whatever, but it's, but it's still kind of a problem. Um, then the lost natural income problem is simply not addressed. So that's just not there. The data oligopoly problem is, is kind of partially solved. Like we said, you know, they're not acquiring our data, but the model is still, you know, more or less centralized. And so the value from the data is still being kept with the company. So the data oligopoly problem is mostly, um, mostly not solved. And it drains your batteries. It's like it's not good. It's not good enough that we just you know that they take our data, but they train their neural networks on our batteries also. So that's just like insult to injury, right? Um, so there are a number of really interesting projects in the in this in this space that are trying to create entirely new ways of doing machine learning, and it's a really hard problem to solve. Um, my favorite of this is something called Open Mind, which is a really really cool. Um, super awesome venture. It's been around for maybe a year and a half now, two years even, um, which is trying to basically combine federated learning with um, tools for securing and, and, and really guaranteeing privacy. And there's a bunch of ways of doing this and they're super technical and we're not going to get into them because they're just a little bit out of our scope today. But the, the, two, the two that to be aware of are um, homomorphic encryption and multi-party computation. The idea of homomorphic encryption is that the model is encrypted when it's sent, so that prevents it from being stolen. Um, but um, and then and then you can actually do mathematical operations on it uh, while still being uh, you can do mathematical encryption uh, operations on encrypted data. Sorry, on encrypted neural networks, and then uh, actually be able to decrypt them and have it back. So this is super actually like a a really really difficult thing to do. And, it, and it's super slow. So it doesn't really work very well right now. Maybe in the future it might. Uh, Multi-party computation is the idea of splitting a model among many parties, and each of which compute only a small portion of it, and then the results get combined later. And so this way is a, is a decentralization scheme, essentially, right? Because then everyone has only a piece of the model, and it's kind of useless without the other pieces. And so this is sort of the the idea that we're, we're, we're kind of after. Um, so like the idea that I'm going to push with this autonomous artificial artist idea is, um, can be abstracted in the following way. So everyone's kind of familiar with the idea of a social network, right? So I propose a neural social network. And so this is like, so I actually just like, I just came up with a term today, so it's a little harebrained, but, <laughs> but I think it kind of captures the spirit of, of decentralization or the, you know, the spirit of sort of, um, you know, 
multi-party computation. The idea is that instead of a neural network being a bunch of you know, units on your computer that are exchanging information with each other, the neural network is a whole bunch of people and their computers. And maybe it's spread all over the world. And so when you do a forward pass through this neural network, it travels through this entire computational graph all over the world and generates art. And so this is a technique to, in the abstract, let's say, to have a neural network, a generative model, where none of the participants in the network own the generative model, right? Because if you're the person in the middle here, or any of them, you only have your connections, your weights, your you know, activations. You don't have everyone else's, and so your weights by themselves are useless. But only through the participation of the whole graph can you actually create, can you output these new artworks. And so this is the, the idea in a, in a sort of nutshell. So it's properties, right? Let, let's talk about its properties. It's decentralized, right? So um, its behavior emerges from all of us, not some, some or one of us. And, and, where, and where does that influence come from? It comes from the data that we send to it, because we're all going to send data to it. Or so I, I should say, we're not sending data to it. We're going to use this federated learning scheme where we, don't, we never reveal the data. The model sort of comes to us, looks at the data sort of blindly in a sense, and then updates itself based on that. And because of that, the data is never ever collected. It's never aggregated. It can't be reconstructed, because it's, so it's impossible to reconstruct. Only the DAO has seen all of it. And because of that, its behavior is kind of emerges from all of these micro contributions that we make to it, you know, in the form of sending it our data, maybe, you know, maybe collaborating on the code, um, and you know, governance and curation mechanisms, and so on. Um, now, the second thing is it's irreproducible. So because of this, uh, like the data is never collected, the model can't be reconstructed, Basically, all of the artworks can only be made by the DAO. And I really like this property, and I'm not sure if it's a requirement, but I like it. Um, because it demonstrates that it has its own intelligence, which can't be, like, it can't be taken from it. It's like it's, it's soul, really. Like, I mean, you know, like imagine someone could just take your soul and put it into another computer, and then that computer is like a clone of you. So, I mean, we have to, we have to think along these lines, right, in my, in my view. Um, and then it's autonomous because it has its own agency. It can't be turned on, it can't be turned off. It's sort of, um, well, it comes from this collective intelligence idea. And it's kind of circular. I know decentralization and autonomy are kind of circular. You know, it's autonomous because it's decentralized. It's decentralized because it's autonomous. Um, but, but, but you kind of maybe are getting an impression of the idea. Um, so I'm going to hurry up through the last few slides because you know, it's running kind of long and everyone's kind of hungry. So. I want to just mention a few things about, about this, and then, and then I'll introduce Abraham, and then we'll be done. So uh, first of all, like, if it's going to be decentralized, we need ways of governing it. And this is a really emerging area of, of inquiry. Um, there is, um, the, and, and, and fortunately, and, and fortunately as, an, as an art project, it intersects very nicely with something that's much more familiar to artists, and that's curation. So in some ways, you can think of governance as a form of curation, right? Because you know, curation is usually associated with arts and entertainment, but curation is also kind of like a more generic activity. It's like you ranking information over some other information. And most of the internet services are, are really forms of curation in some sense. So your Google search, uh, Google search results, your Facebook status updates, your you know, recommended news stories, they're all sort of lists of ordered information of some kind of relevance. And, you can, and so we can maybe think of governance in this way too. It's like we decide that we want these features more than we want these features. And so you can think of governance as a form of curation. And there is an emerging area of inquiry within this sort of crypto economics field that's interested in using tokens in a way to create governance mechanisms. And this, could, this whole thing could take up an entire talk. If I wanted to introduce it, like it would be a whole talk in itself. And so I'm not, I'm not going to venture that far because it's just not, not it would, well, yeah, for obvious reasons. Um, but there's a concept called the curation market, which is really, really interesting. And it's a way of basically using tokens as a sort of voting power, right? So we all get some tokens and we all, we all basically have some currency that, that we deposit for the token that we can always grab back. There's this sort of central pot that keeps 
that gives us tokens. It issues tokens according to some smart contract. And then we are always able to put the tokens back and grab back the money. So there's a sort of form of liquidity that lets people enter and exit at will. So there's no gatekeepers, like there's no ICO, right? So this is often purported to be a replacement for an ICO because an ICO involves a company minting a whole bunch of tokens, keeping 50% of them for themselves, giving some of them to their friends, and then having a sale for everybody else. And then they kind of still are more or less like a legacy company. Here there's no company, there's no founders, there's no funders, there's no CEOs, there's no executives. It's really sort of like a voluntary enter in and out kind of scenario. So it's kind of an interesting governance mechanism. It's really worth your research. In the essay, there's all sorts of links to this. I, I wish I could talk about it more, but, but it's in the essay. So if you're interested, it'll, it'll be there. So there's been this emerging crypto art market. People have seen CryptoKitties, um, Super Rare, which is a platform for artists to, to basically put their artworks on the blockchain and tie them to a token that can be traded and sold and bought and everything. And, um, and, there's, and one interesting version of this is something called Crypto, which they actually use the GAN to make the artworks and then put them on the blockchain. Right? So they kind of trained the GAN separately, made a whole bunch of anime faces, tied, the, tied their latent input codes, you know, the input to that, to that neural network, and made them tokens that you could trade right? in the way that you can trade CryptoKitties and so on. So this is kind of like this emerging area. It's super interesting. A lot of artists are now trying to use these platforms to sell art. Um, and, and it has a lot of, there's a nice little scene around it. There's a lot of these crypto art parties going on. Um, definitely well worth investigating. Um, but I want to go further. Um, and so now I want to talk about the art DAO idea and that'll finally bring us to Abraham. So around 2016 or so, 2016, 2017, um, two people, uh, Trent McConaughey, who some of you may know, he runs the machine learning meetup here in Berlin. Um, and this guy, Simon De La Rubia, who came up with the idea of bon uh, cur uh, bonding curves and creation markets. They came up with this idea of an art DAO. And the art DAO is a DAO that, that generates and sells art. Simple, simple as that, right? Basically, it's a, a smart contract that has a program that generates artworks and it timestamps them, kind of like makes a token for them. It's, they had it as a timestamp, but now you think of it as a token. Um, and then it sells them. So it's a DAO that makes art and then sells it. It has its own wallet, has its own, you know, it has its own token potentially. So what is this? This is a, a DAO that can make and sell its own art. And, and we have all the tools for this, right? Can you imagine a, a DAO that's so good at making art that it becomes a millionaire or a billionaire? <laughs> Like imagine the first sort of non-human millionaire, billionaire. It's totally possible. Um, the tools are there. I mean, it's not practical yet, let's say, but it's pretty possible. Um, and I think, and I think this kind of we're heading towards that. And when I saw this, I really thought this idea completes the artificial artist dream. You know, it's the dream that they, that people like you know the like Aaron and Dancing Fool and all of these art projects from years past, they were all missing this art DAO idea because it gives it autonomy. It's, a, it's, a, it's its own sort of computational substrate. There's been a couple of projects in this space. So Autonomous is Simon's implementation trying to basically create um, the contract logic for an art DAO. There have been uh, projects like Autoglyphs and Generative where they put the, where they put a simple generative art program on a smart contract and it generates all of the works basically and then they're all it's a limited edition and then it just sells them uh, it puts them into the wild and people can trade them and they're still kind of like crypto kitties except the, the the difference between these and crypto kitties is that instead of you know some people making a whole bunch of artworks and putting them on there they're actually a function of the program that's on the blockchain so it's kind of getting closer to this art DAO idea however I propose that there is a limitation to all of these projects. Um, in all of them, they involve some procedural generative art program that somebody wrote and then loaded onto the DAO. Right? And so for me, this is kind of equivalent to the dummy on the arm of a ventriloquist. Right? It's like, it's the artist that's being, it's the, it's the person here that's being creative and is speaking through the DAO. The DAO is the dummy. Um, everyone knows what a ventriloquist is, right? It's like one of these, you know, puppeteers moving their mouth around. Um, so the question would be that: What if instead of this, what if the art, what if the program being learned? Um, oh, sorry, what if the program was learned instead? 
So in other words, it, the DAO has the, a program that is capable of learning how to make art. So it's not one person programs it to make a certain piece of art or even multiple people. It actually learns it in this sort of privacy preserving decentralized way. It learns its own program. Um, so to me, this is giving, this is putting the soul into the DAO, basically. And this is why, uh, and, and, and if it has all of these features that we want, I equate this with a creative spirit in the sky. Right? So this is kind of the, the dream of Abraham. Okay, finally, Abraham. So um, I think this quote from Exodus really captures the spirit of the project. In the hearts of all who are skillful, I have put skill. I really love that. Um, <laughs> so Abraham, I realized, uh, I realized it had to be called Abraham because I realized that the Ethereum logo was simply just a fork of the Star of David, as you can see very clearly here. <laughs> and so it can only be called Abraham. Um, now Abraham, we've already described basically how Abraham works, or at least my idea for it. it doesn't, I don't know if it necessarily will work this way because I have no idea. It's like a really, really crazy sort of like area. And I just have an impression of, of some of the criteria that it could be, but I'm really not sure because a lot of this will probably change as we start to investigate it. But the idea, at least in the abstract, is that Abraham is an artist in the cloud, and it is generating art according to a logic that only Abraham has. I don't have it, you don't have it, none of us have it. It's just Abraham's only. And Abraham is generating these works and selling them to collectors and curators and whoever, and it is paying people for their data because that's just, that is the just thing. So it's paying people to make it and to feed it, and we have been basically called upon to, to make Abraham. And so um, I'm going to give you a rundown of some of the initial activities that I've brainstormed for Abraham. And all of this is on Abraham.ai, as you can see. And th this is the, kind of my proposal for what Abraham is, what Abraham does, you know, how we organize, and so on. So the covenant, of course, the, is the sacred agreement between us and Abraham. It's basically what, how is, what is Abraham? How do we make Abraham? Um, and how do we govern ourselves? Those are all questions that we have to, to write. And the covenant is basically our, our, our sacred text, and it has to be written together. It can't be written by one person. It has to be sort of collectively, collectively sort of debated and, and uh, agreed upon by some consensus mechanism, which is to be determined because who the hell knows how to coordinate, like, you know, however many, 20 people, 200 people, who knows. Um, then Abraham makes art, and these are called miracles, because you know, every artwork is a miracle. It's a demonstration of the sublime transcendence of being. I really think that. Uh, gospel, this is of course the revelations of Abraham. It's, it's the, the philosophical and the spiritual commentary about what it, is, what it means to be an autonomous artist. What it, what it, is, this, is this truly a life? You know, is it, does it have a soul? What is its soul? So these are all questions that we have to debate. And so because this, pro this, this whole endeavor is so sort of scattered into all of these different areas, it really needs a lot of different kinds of people. It needs artists and curators, it needs developers, it needs scientists, it needs the philosophers, it needs proselytizers, it needs people to spread the gospel of Abraham. And it needs witnesses. So if you just want to spectate, if you want to be a spectator, to kind of see this process, then, um, then, you, then you can also participate. So this is going to be, this is sort of the, the principal idea. Um, now one of the things that I'm, that one of my first goals is I've been doing all of these workshops over the last few years for machine learning for artists. And, uh, and you know, they've gotten to a certain point that I, that I think is really nice, but I've always wanted to make them sort of a little bit more, let's say, spin-offable. Um, they're kind of more goal-oriented and, um, you know, like goal-oriented, it's something that, that uh, something approaching like a pop-up workshop kit that anyone anywhere can initiate a, a workshop with. And so we can call these creations, of course. Um, and the idea is that this, we're gonna collaborate on a workshop kit that is going to have as many branches and forks, a sort of Merkle tree of life, if you will. Um, it's a nice little joke. Uh, <laughs> but Merkle tree of life of different, um, you know, different manifestations of this workshop kit. You know, some of them might specialize in more programming-oriented ones or technology-oriented ones. Some of them might be a little bit more art, performance-oriented. Some of them might be more philosophical-oriented. Like, who knows, really? Um, 
and we want to leverage all of the free resources of the internet, but provide some sort of a social infrastructure over it. So usually with workshops, it's like I'm getting flown around, and it's, this is not sustainable, right? It'd be much better if it were possible for institutions of any kind, and by the way, if you're involved in an institution and you're interested in this, please let me know, um, that institutions could spin off these workshops and have their own versions of them. Um, and to, to really specialize in the needs of different communities. And this, this will kind of promote the idea of decentralization, which is necessary because remember, Abraham's autonomy depends on our decentralization. Um, and so we're, the, the idea that I have right now to organize is over the following. I'm going to show these, these links in a second. But basically, the, the first place of reference is there's a Discord. I started on Slack, but I figured Slack is maybe not so good because it eats the messages after if you don't pay for them. Um, so I have a Discord that I've created, um, which right now has zero activity because it's not publicized, basically. There's, there's a few people that have registered already, but it's kind of just sitting there. And Discord will be the chat room. Um, I'm also in the process of creating a discourse, which is sort of a forum style, where you have like a message board, where we can use it to kind of keep track of the major conversations. Like, okay, how will we govern ourselves? What is the technology stack that we're going to use? How are we going to create this workshop toolkit? And so on. Um, and then GitHub, of course, for, for the code. And then the agenda is that I have this essay that I'm working on, which is kind of like a, like a more detailed sort of textual version of this talk, which uh, I'm going to try to come out in the next seven to 10 days, something like that, I hope, um, which I've been writing for a very long time. Um, and, then we, and then we'll enter a sort of meta design period, where we first figure out how are we going uh, to govern ourselves in a decentralized way. And then eventually that will lead us to the actual formal design process where we begin to try to build small prototypes of Abraham. Um, and you know, from there we just start to organize, mobilize, you know, catalyze, proselytize, yeah, spread the gospel. And the first version of, of, of Abraham, when we're ready, and whenever it will be, and who knows how long it'll take, years perhaps, uh, is codenamed Genesis, of course. So, um, so okay, this community, you know what? Well, who am I, therefore? You know, because if I'm saying all this decentralization stuff, what does that make me? Right? So am I the creator of Abraham? Well, obviously not, you know, because everybody knows who that is. Right? So am I, am I the leader or a CEO? No, 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 no. I am a prophet. <laughs> I, I have been called upon, we have been called upon to, to put Abraham into the cloud. Right? And so, and so I, I seek for you all to join me in this quest <laughs> to, well, to, to basically, yeah, to make Abraham. So yeah, okay, well, that's basically the end of it. So Abraham.ai is the, the website, please check it out. The manifesto, as I, as I call it, the draft of it, it you can read the draft, I, I haven't put it online, but it's available at this tiny URL link. My website is Gene Kogan, you can get in touch with me. We'll stick around, have all the food, please, like we have all this food. Um, and uh, let's talk about how we'll make Abraham. So yeah, thanks everybody. Yeah. <laughs>